Sheffield's premier poodle permed rock gods Death Leopard leading into this lecture on photography. So, so what I want to do with this lecture is pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> go through the developments in 19th century visual media. So we're up already in the sort of course here up to the 19th century already. So we're progressing really quickly. And photography and the revolution in portraiture. So that'll be video two. So this first video is going to be on the sort of technical developments of photography in the 20th in the 19th century, and then um, how photography became a critically important form of class signifier in the 19th century, in the later part of the 19th century after it had been established. So obviously humanity is a long long history of image making going back to when we were living in caves and making you know paintings and drawings on caves to represent the world around us so for you know as long as human beings have been able to walk and move they have been making images of the world around them and there's a long long history to this with the printing press, we see a move to reproducible images. So you make one image and you can produce it again and again and again. Um, now, that doesn't just start with the printing press. It's actually around about 100 years before the development of the printing press in the 15th century. You woodcut prints uh, were known in Germany from the 14th century and in other countries in Europe as well. So in the 15th century, printing from an etched metal plate the printing press laid the basis for a commercial industry in the reproduction of images in order for them to be consumed as a form of media. Um, when we get up to the 18th century, the 1700s, prints on paper were very, very popular. Uh, they were sold from specialist print shops collected by wealthy people and used as a signifier of wealth in the home. If you were wealthy enough to spend your money, on something as frivolous as a print to go on a wall, then you were clearly wealthy, you know, and so it becomes an indicator of wealth and status within society to collect and have prints around the home as um, as something to make your home look nice, you know. Who would think that putting things on the wall would make your home look nice? My, mine's pretty bare, to be fair. So, really, with developments in printing in the 19th century, you see an industrialization of this image-based media. Uh, in 1822, copper plates were replaced with steel plates, which increased print runs from five, which increased prints from 500 to 1500 per plate. So you actually get many more prints. In 1930, the popular uh, popularity of the stone lithography and stone lithography becomes apparent, and you start to get again get a huge amount more in terms of quality and in terms of the number of prints you can make. And then you get the rise of mass circulated illustrated newspapers at the same time, uh, which I've already talked about in lecture two, right? So um, there's a big, big market out there for image-based media in the 19th century, which has been building over a number of centuries beforehand. In terms of newspapers, you know, the Penny Magazine in 1832 and the Illustrated London News in 1843, you get cheap mass-produced images of the world. You know, so you'd get someone, you'd commission someone normally to draw something about an event that would be reproduced in newspapers, circulated around the place. And it increases demand for image based media in general amongst the population. But taking an image of the world is not the same as reproducing through a drawing. And even at this point in the development of media, we are not in a position where you can actually take an image like this and reproduce it fully. So there still needs to be developments before we get to the photograph itself. So if photography, some of the principles of photography have been around for a very, very long time. So the projection of images using lenses, for example, has a very long history, as you can see here with the camera obscura, um, often used in art, um, and things like the camera obscura could be room-sized or portable for artists to use. Please do look up, and I'll put some stuff on canvas about the camera obscura to explain the process and what it actually does and, you know, how it works, for example. Sorry, I'm just sorting my hair out. It's a bit of a state today. That's better. OK, um, so some of the principles of fixing images and what's important about the camera obscura is the way that it fixes an image. 
And that's a very important principle because the idea of the fixicity of the image itself is what was troubling in terms of the scientific progress towards having photography as a medium. How do we fix an image? How do you take and capture an image and fix it on something so it becomes permanent in that way? This was the big challenge for scientists. We call it the problem of fixity, uh, how to fix those images. Now, there were lots of early experiments for this. For example, the uh, potter, Thomas Wedgwood, was doing a number of experiments in uh, around 1800, something like that. But the first permanent image uh, came in 1826 by uh, Joseph Nipis. Um, a view using a camera obscura, just like I've shown you, uh, with an eight hour exposure. It took eight hours for the image to fix onto the plate that it was cast on. And I can show you that image now. This is the, the image itself. It's the view from the window at Le Gras. It is the first photograph ever taken. It is the, the very first photograph ever. Um, so here it is. Um, what uh, was done here was, you know, you would basically opened up the aperture on the uh, camera obscura and this image was cast onto a plate, a metal plate coated with particular chemicals. And after eight hours, it had been developed for long enough that it was fixed onto that metal plate. This is what I'm talking about. So this is very different to what we understand a photograph to be. Now, today, we don't really do photographs physically at all. You know, photography is largely digital. But you will, of course, be aware of physical photographs on, you know, on film that's been developed into a photograph. It's a little flimsy piece of sort of semi paper. You know, it's a more card, I suppose, than paper. The original photograph was cast onto a gigantic metal plate. Um, so you, you might think, OK, well, what's the issues that arise from this? Well, one, it's heavy. It's not exactly portable or mobile. And two, the, even the fixicity of the image itself was quite poor because, the, you know, the plate was um, treated with certain chemicals in order for the image to be captured on it. If you touched the plate, you could disturb the chemicals and therefore erase the image. So the, it wasn't even quite permanent at this point, but it was as permanent as things had actually gotten. That is the actual plate that was used. As you can see, the image isn't on it anymore because it wasn't a permanent thing, but it was a massive movement towards fixicity of um, imagery. The next movement in terms of improving the process was the daguerreotype. So using, again, a piece of metal, a light sensitive silver coated metal plate um, developed using mercury vapor. So you would have mercury vapor on the uh, plate itself and around the plate, and that would help fix the image, gave a single image wasn't reproducible you know you couldn't take this and reproduce from it um so each one was unique uh, and quite like a mirror um now much better bet you know a, a real step onwards the images themselves much much prettier much better images so it's a move forward in terms of quality not in terms of reproducibility and still not really in terms of mobility or anything like that. you're still dealing with sheets of metal and chemicals and so on especially mercury vapor. I don't know if you know a lot about the, um, the properties of mercury, but mercury vapor is not something you actually want to be inhaling, for example, because it'll kill you. So yeah, it, you know, it's still a very scientific industrial process of this thing. No democratization of photography by this point. You know, you still have to be highly skilled to do this kind of work. But this is the uh, sort of thing that a daguerreotype could produce. You see some, you know, there's detail in this image. There is, hues of color going on here now it's, it's obviously it's not in full color but you know you can differentiate between different colors on the uh, in the image itself so you know, it's a it's a big step forward from that grainy old view at Legras. you know this is much more like we what we would expect the photograph to look like so, but there are of course huge limitations with this so it's a unique image it's not ne the no negative produced to it so it's not reproducible they are actually quite hard to see you know they're not brilliant by any means the image was fragile very easily ruined you needed a protective case basically for this to keep it for any length of time and we still had although we were down from eight hours at this point in time there was lengthy exposure times and it was a very very complex process you know you needed to be quite expert in chemistry for example to produce these things so but you're starting to see the movement in the transformation in image making of the photographic revolution. You're starting to see exact reproductions of nature by nature because you use natural light in order to produce these. 
and an automatic objective process versus the history that we've had previous that of subjective image making where you know somebody would draw something and in drawing something they would be you know implanting their own objective view on what those events were when we move towards photography we start to see a much more objective process albeit we shouldn't argue that photographs are entirely objective either because they're always taken from a particular subjective position by the end of the 19th century, producing photographs still required a lot of expensive equipment, chemicals, knowledge of processes, darkroom skills, for example. It was a skill for the wealthy or businessmen, but it wasn't really democratised or anything like that. So even post these early movements of the daguerreotype and so on, it, it, they didn't improve so much until the end of the 19th century. The big movement came from the company Kodak. George Eastman um, was the founder of Kodak and experimented with film, uh, introducing the celluloid roll film in 1889 and in 1900 introduced the Kodak box brownie um, for one dollar. You could buy a camera for a dollar. All you needed was a piece of, you know, a roll of this celluloid film, put it into the one dollar camera you've bought, you push the button, they do the rest, you take the film back to Kodak, they develop it, and this democratised image taking entirely. You introduce the everyday photo the idea of everyday photography as a thing that people do, and the notion of the snapshot, how we capture the world around us. This is what a box brownie looked like. Uh, this is one of the first models of it, manufactured in uh, March 1900. So you had a hinge card at the back, sliding metal latch. Uh, optional viewfinder became in August of that year. Um, doesn't really look like what we would think a camera would look like, but it was extremely effective and incredibly popular. For one buck, you could have a camera and you could start taking photos of the world. Wow, they flew out of shops. They were huge you have a democratization of imagery. That's really all I want to say about the um, historical aspect of the development of photography. Uh, video two, go backwards a little bit from the Box Brownie and uh, Kodak and Eastman to the time where we move on from the daguerreotype to other forms of um, image capture in Victorian times and what they meant in terms of class and what they meant in terms of the status of photography as a medium and how Photography as a medium transformed Victorian society. See you in video two.